<clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the virtual opening of Color Field, the newest installation of our temporary public art program. My name is Beth Madison and I am proud to be an alumni of this university and to now serve as a member of the Board of Regents. It is in that role that I was appointed to serve on the system-wide public art committee and it has been such a pleasure uh, to experience the transformation of our public art uh, collection, which has evolved over 50 years. And I am so happy to champion its mission under the wonderful direction of our chancellor and president, Renu Couture. She regrets she cannot be with us this evening and ascends her thank you, but we thank her for her continued dedication and support to this program. Renu is famous for saying, let's put the public back in public art. And that's where you come in. Last year, I welcome many of you to our 50th anniversary celebration. Thank you for joining us again and welcome to the new faces that are with us this evening. Tonight's program will celebrate the newest installation for our temporary art program with Color Field. We hope you will see what a treasure this program is for the city of Houston. We truly do not want this to be a secret. Of course, we wish we were gathering in person together to enjoy the art and each other, but we hope tonight's program will entice you to make your way to the campus soon and stroll through the park-like uh, park setting. It's truly uh, a delightful experience. And I hope you will now take a moment to recognize the supporter of this program the Brown Foundation. This exhibition is made possible through their support and we are very excited to embody their mission of striving to make Houston a stronger and more vibrant community. Please accept our heartfelt thanks. Truly we are indebted to you. I am also delighted to introduce Judy Nyquist, a member of the university's Board of Visitors and the chair of the Public Art Task Force. Her support throughout uh, our work on bringing in this collection to you has been meaningful, profound, and inspiring. Thank you, Judy. Hello. There we go. Thank you, thank you, Beth, and um, welcome everyone. Um, I, it's really a privilege to um, be here today um, with you and um, with this amazing exhibition, as Beth said, the opening of Color Field, which is our second in hopefully a long series of temporary public art exhibitions. And in my capacity as chair of the Board of Visitors, um, the chair of the public art of the Board of Visitors, that's task force, that's a mouthful. Um, obviously, I would prefer to see you in person on site um, amongst these really joyful creations, but um, alas, here we are. During the five years um, of my involvement with public art at UH, I've seen really tremendous growth, but most importantly and significantly for me also is how res the responsible stewardship of over 500 works in the collection. I'm proud to be part of the leadership of overseeing these spectacular treasures, which are literally at your back door, unless of course you're tuning in from a distance, and free to be explored. And it is my sincere hope, as Beth has already mentioned, that you will be inspired to visit often. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing the curators, the very accomplished curators, I might say, of the Houston edition of Color Field, Allison Glenn and Maria Gazambide. Allison served as the chief curator of the, Crystal, uh, of the exhibition at Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas, and has been working closely with Maria, mostly virtually, I think, if not entirely virtually, uh, to realize the exhibition here. So um, I have some uh, brief bios, um, so bear with me because these are indeed very accomplished ladies. Allison is the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, where she shapes how outdoor sculpture, 
activates and engages the museum's 120 acre campus. She was a member of the curatorial team for State of the Art 2020, an exhibition that opened simultaneously at the Momentary, which is the new space there in Arkansas, in Bentonville, and Crystal Bridges, and spearheaded the adaptation of Hank Willis Thomas's All Things Being Equal, also in 2020, which was at Crystal Bridges, well, but organized by the Portland Art Museum. Prior to this, Glenn was manager of publications and curatorial associate for Prospect New Orleans's International Art Triennial Prospect 4, The Lotus in Spite of the Swamp. Glenn's writing has been featured in exhibition publications produced by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Kempner Museum, Prospect New Orleans, DePaul Art Museum, Rebuild Foundation, the uh, the California African American Museum, University at Buffalo Art Galleries, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, as far as periodicals, she's contributed to Hyperallergenic, Hyperallergic, I'm sorry, Art 21 Magazine, Art Papers, Pelican Bombs, Art Review, and New City, among other, others. Welcome, welcome, Allison. Maria Gazambide, um, no uh, stranger to most of you here, is the inaugural director and chief curator of public art of the University of Houston system. Her work over the years has focused on the intersection of art, technology, and the public realm. Prior to joining UH, Maria was associate director of the International Center for the Arts of the Americas at the Museum of, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston which is a research center focused on 20th century Latin American and US-based Latino art. During her nearly 13 years, you must have started at age 12, Maria, 13-year um, tenure at the MFAH, her work spanned administration, research, publications, and long-term exhibition projects. She also direct, directed a continentally scaled collaborative program centered on archival retrieval and massive dissemination of primary sources and critical documents from Latin America and Latino US um, that are made available to the global learning community through a web-based platform. And this is incredibly important work that has um, really put this, the, the Latin American program at the MFAH and also this, this particular uh, research area on the map. So we're so really grateful for all of the work that uh, Maria did in its formative time. Previously, she was a curator and taught at the Tulane University worked for the Smithsonian Institution, specifically in the Archives of American Art, which brought her to Washington, New York, and Puerto Rico. Um, she was as well uh, involved in the Museum of Art Puerto Rico during its gestational just, just, just phase. Please join me in welcoming these two incredibly accomplished ladies. Um, and we are in for a treat tonight as they help us explore the exhibition color field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. As Judy mentioned, my name is Maria Gastambide, and I am so proud to serve as Director and Chief Curator for Public Art of the University of Houston System. Please join me again in thanking Regent Beth Madison and Judy Nyquist for their incredible passion and leadership. Learning about UH from them has been important for me over these past two years. It is an honor to lead public art at a time when we are transforming it into a true museum without walls for the enjoyment of all of Houston's diverse communities. Being here with you all in support of public art brings that dream even more alive. By its very nature, public art is a collective effort and I am delighted that you are here in support of work that extends the reach of art to more people in Houston and beyond. Thank you, thanks for joining us. To echo Regent Madison, thanks to the initial grant from the Brown Foundation Inc. Last year, we launched the Temporary Public Art Program, our program of rota rotating outdoor exhibitions of which Color Field is the second project. Color Field is moreover the first curated exhibition of outdoor sculpture ever presented at the University of Houston. 
And as part of our temporary public art program, every academic year from October through May, we will bring to Houston exciting new exhibitions and projects that complement our permanent exhibition. And this is a perfect example. With that, let me say that I am excited um, to be here with Allison. Welcome, Allison. And with you, of course, joining from home to talk more about um, Color Field. We have planned a 30-minute conversation followed by um, a Q&A session at the end. Please feel free to post your questions on the Q&A chat box at any time during the conversation. And you'll notice, um, I'm sure you'll find it, but we will be getting to as many of the questions as we can during the session. So we um, wanted to begin uh, framing the conversation by artworks that, and um, artists who set the stage for color field. If I could have the first of our slides, I, I'd appreciate it. The term color field painting is applied to the work of abstract painters working since the middle decades of the 20th century, characterized by large areas of a more or less flat single color. Color field actually emerged in the 50s from within abstract expressionism, but at the same time suggested an alternative lineage influenced by currents that were emanating from outside of the artistic mainstream, among them the Washington Color F School and even Helen Frankenthaler's work. This is um, a dual image of Jackson Pollock hard work and it's the, probably the most iconic image of, of his, his process. Next slide, please. Here are um, two works by um, de Kooning and Gorky, and these are examples of this kind of paradigmatic images of abstract, abstract expressionism. And you can see kind of see the thick um, impasto, thick application of paint, the gestures and the strokes are all very, very noticeable. Next slide, please. And here, Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm Number no. Thirty, one of the one of the his his greatest achievements. Again, thick application of pa of paint, dense, very active painting. Next, please. Color field, in contrast, emerged from within the movement, but at the same time suggested an alternative lineage, influenced by currents that were emanating, like I said, from from this idea of the periphery, from the color, Washington Color Field School or even Frankenthaler's work. The New York critic Clement Greenberg had observed as these styles were emerging, he had observed a differentiating factor, um, the tendency towards all over color, which ultimately led to the coining of the term color field. And he noticed this in the work of Frankenthaler and several other members of the so-called first generation of abstract expressionists. So Clifford Still on the left, Barnett Newman. Next slide, please. And of course, Mark Rothko, with, who, who we know very well in, in Houston through his magnus opus, the, the Rothko Chapel. These artists place less emphasis on gesture, brush, brush strokes, and action in favor of an overall consistency of form and process, eliminating the sort of highly personal and painterly or gestural application of material. But then, in the 60s, breakthroughs. Next slide, please. Starting around 1968, Sam Gilliam blurred the lines between painting and sculpture in um, effectively removing his canvases from the stretcher. And this is um, a work from his Drapes series. Slide, please. At the same time that other artists advance what would become lifelong concerns with launching color into space through perception. And this is a work by Carlos Cruz Diez. Next. Movement and vibration, a work by Jesus Rafael Soto. Next. The Embodiment of Color, here I'm showing you a number of works from Elio, made by Elio Oitisica. Next slide. Here again, another, another proposition by Oitisica, this, this one at a sculpture park in Minas Gerais in Brazil. Next. And then also light. So one example um, by Carlos Cruz Diez. And next slide, please. 
and of course, early examples by the American artist James Terrell, another beloved um, artist who's, uh, who's featured very prominently in, in Houston. Next. This is um, work that is actually a Crystal Bridges, one of his beautiful skyscape spaces, um, the way of color, the interior of it. And I, I believe Allison will talk a little bit more about, about how that came about. So color field then emerged as an alternate visual language um, that emerged, like I said, outside of the mainstream and has been um, brought to its fore or brought to its great greatest achievement through the work of contemporary sculptors who are again concerned with releasing color into the space that we walk on. I wondered, Allison, if maybe you could talk a little bit about that. We've had some conversations about how a color field was indeed um, a movement that spoke to the mainstream, but from the periphery. And I think we have some, some interesting stories to share. Sure, yeah, thank you, Maria. And that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for walking us through from ABEX to, um, to kind of color field where we're at right now. Um, so one of the things that was really interesting to me when I first started at Crystal Bridges was thinking about the contemporary collection. And so um, we have a 120 acre campus at the main museum and uh, that is comprised of both indoor and outdoor collection. Inside there is a wonderful uh, selection of Abex and Colorfield painters and we've, we're not yet a decade old. So Crystal Bridges is a really, really new museum and a big part of the responsibility of the curatorial team is to think about how we introduce ideas and concepts uh, through accessibility. And so when I first started, I, I was interested in the collection inside and specifically interested in all of the color field paintings that were on view by people like Felrath Hines, who's maybe a little less lesser known. He actually worked at the Smithsonian as a, um, I believe he was a conservator. And then of course, Helen Frankenthaler. And so these three paintings here are an example of the paintings that were in the collection and kind of the impetus for the exhibition idea. So um, many people know this, but Clement Greenberg was actually dating Helen Frankenthaler when she started her soak staining technique. And Helen was actually moved to think about soak staining, which is pouring paint onto the canvas on the ground after befriending Jackson Pollock, who had an exhibition at the undergraduate university that she was attending. And so there is a direct lineage, as Maria clearly articulated, between Abex and, and color field. Um, when Clement had seen the way that Helen was painting, he told his friends, Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland, you have to come up from DC to see how this young painter in New York is, is applying paint to the canvas. And that was, it's a bit of a lesser known conversation around how the spread of color field and the development of the Washington Color School. Alma Thomas is also a great example. Um, and so really starting with the collection and starting with this idea of large swaths of color, paint, um, what is the painting? You know, what is, um, how were these artists dealing with space, either the flattening of space or moving into different dimensions. And I think that's a great kind of way to talk about the point of departure for the exhibition at Crystal Bridges. So we have three key pillars and they're art, architecture, and nature. And um, this is an aerial view of a portion of the museum. And so we have 120 acres, over three miles of trails, a 200,000 square foot interior space, and 60,000 square feet of exhibition space. We are a massive campus and we share that with the University of Houston. Um, there's a lot of space to contend with and one of the biggest and funnest challenges is to think about how our different audiences engage with not only the trail system but also the museum inside and how we might bridge those two audiences. So there were a few kind of key installation tactics that were employed. Oh, here's the Terrell. Okay, so I'll speak to this. Um, so the Terrell was the first artwork in our collection before the museum opened in 2011. The uh, Sky Space, The Way of Color 
was installed permanently in 2009 on our grounds. And this was meant to be an example of what art would look like and perhaps what contemporary art could look like on Crystal Bridges campus. Next slide. And so going back to the idea of bridging the museum interior with the exterior space, this is a view of our North Forest. And there's about 1.1 miles of an art trail. So there were a few artworks that were installed in these interstitial spaces with so the entrance to the museum and in one of our um, kind of atriums overlooking the water. And then most of the exhibition was, was focused in what we call our second loop of the North Forest. So this is an example of the work that was at the entrance. And it was really about punctuating not only the interior architecture, but also the exterior architecture of our Moshe Softy designed building with these artworks that spoke to the themes of the exhibition. So here we, say, we see a soft Efron, and then next slide. This is Claire Helen Ashley. So there was a corridor gallery that was installed with these inflatable sculptures that she calls paintings. And then this, this exterior atrium. And so the image on the left is what visitors would experience when they walked into that space and really questioning notions of painting, pointing to canonical artists like Sam Gilliam, and really expanding our understanding of the relationship of our body to, to painting in space. And at the same time, you also wanted to kind of solve a more, more um, a, let's just say a simpler problem. You had a, a group of people that would uh, enjoy the paths and the trails and experience mm -hmm. nature, but wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily come into the museum. And then you had the opposite, people that would come to the museum but never venture outside. So that was very much on your mind as well. Yes, absolutely. How could we use the artworks to direct visitors to perhaps go inside if they didn't or visit the trails if they didn't. Um, and so there's, there are many ways um, that we punctuated the landscape with these objects that would either draw you in or draw you out. This is Jessica Stockholder, a log. Now this work is not at the University of Houston. Amanda Ross Ho, the character and shape of illuminated things. This was originally commissioned for the MCA Chicago and reconfigured for the exhibition here at Crystal Bridges. It did not tour. And then Odili Donald Odita. Do you want to talk about this, Maria? Should we? Um, let's wait a little bit because we're going to we're going to spotlight him and um, Sarah's pieces in a little bit. So let's hold off on those. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Okay, and so here we, here we are then um, in Houston, and one of the things that we, I think we want to spend a little time talking about, Allison, is how we, we've interpreted or reinterpreted an original concept from Crystal Bridges, but interpreted here in Houston for um, a different community context, um, different site and sight lines, different articulations of um, different types of conversations be, because our work or the works in color field are here um, arranged around our extensive permanent collection. Next slide, please. So let's let's just begin the experience by showing you a quick um, video on how the campus has come alive with these works. So if this is a map of how the exhibition is displayed at UH, if um, the challenge for Crystal Bridges was how to kind of bridge those two audiences, our challenge, and I think something that is really fascinating about how the exhibition process has unraveled is that we already knew about COVID when we started to rethink how, how we could conceptualize the exhibition with under that reality. 
And one of the things that we have done is that we have um, re and or enhanced our website so that there is almost an indivisible quality to the experience for the exhibition on the website and on campus. So there's quite a bit of overlap and link from um, on campus to our website at any given moment. Next slide, please. I'm just going to go, let's go through these quickly. These are some views of the works at, at UH. This is, that was Typo, Forms from Life. This is Spencer Finch's Back to Kansas. Here are two works by Jeffy Brewer, Cloud and Pink Sexy. And actually, um, these works, uh, the one on the right is a new addition. It didn't, it was not in um, Arkansas. It's right here. It's making its exhibition debut right here in Houston. Jeffy's works are very accessible and for both institutions, it was very necessary to um, create opportunities for engaging with art by um, multiple communities. And so Jeffy's work does that incredibly well. This is another one of his pieces, Pop. Next, please. And here is um, Maze by Sam Falls. It's a very interactive piece. Here's another one of his pieces, Wind Chimes. So we have two pieces by Sam Falls. They're both um, interactive and hinge on viewer participation for, for the full experience. And then we have this great um, piece. It is a soundscape. If we could play it for, for a moment. It's by Amos Cochran. He is an Arkansas-based artist. And the piece that we brought is Outside In. There's actually two pieces, um, which were both displayed in Arkansas, Outside In and then Inside Out. But we opted to bring the one that is um, more clearly associated with the outdoor environment. And maybe you want to give us a little sense of how, where he drew his inspiration, Allison, because it's a, it's sure. a neat story. Absolutely. So there, um, Arkansas has incredible sunsets, right? There's this incredible landscape and color, and it has been captured by photographers for decades. This Eggleston photograph is actually one that um, we came across and we were thinking about how to incorporate sound as not only an element to, to bring our different publics into, into the museum and outside of the museum, but also how to kind of punctuate the derive. So how to create um, an element of exploration or support exploration through an element of sound. And so the Eggleston photograph was a really kind of wonderful jumping off point. Um, this is a Southgate shopping center and it's either in a community very close to Bentonville called Rogers or it's in um, central Arkansas. But nonetheless, it is of an iconic Arkansas sunset and a kind of uh, endlessly stretching parking lot, which which feels a bit <laughs> a bit like Arkansas um, in some places. And so, when Amos created this work, and, and Maria, feel free to chime in because you also had wonderful conversations with him, and and I'd love to hear about how you shaped this for your campus. So, um, what choice? What was your choice like when you decided to take just one of the soundscapes? What was that decision process like? Well. Um... Early on, we had thought that we would take both, but then kind of logistics um, ruled and we had to focus on just one site. Um, and we ended up focusing or choosing Wilhelmina's Grove, which is the home for a temporary public art program. And it's interesting because our, our community is now used to seeing artwork displayed at this very space. And in a way, yes, the sound piece is, is very much art, an artwork, but they will be pleasantly surprised. Um, it is one of the remaining groves for the university. So the university was actually developed in this amazing wooded area. And this along with several other pockets across our campus are what remain of, the, of these woods. And his piece is actually in the middle of that environment, a very natural environment. And then we've provided shade and seating opportunities. And our hope is that people will sit and reflect and contemplate um, the works that, um, the visual artworks that are on easy view from this location. But something that is very interesting that I'm also seeing happening is that our College of Music opens up to this wooded area. And already there are wonderful instances where I have seen students practicing their instruments and kind of enhancing 
the sound and it's just truly magical, which is something unexpected. Wow, that sounds so amazing. Okay, so um, we thought then, um, because time is uh, of the essence, we are going to focus on two works that I think both of them together really encapsulate the, the feeling and the sentiment behind, behind the show. This is uh, Here by Sarah Brayman, and she draws on both sort of East Coast and West Coast minimalism and um, is very interested in the sort of the juxtaposition of solid sort of found materials, everyday materials, which, which of course is something that has gone on throughout art history. But then she kind of combines them with light and ephemeral sort of colored pieces. And for our community here in, in Houston, we will, there's some, some, some overlap with um, Marta Chilindron's Mobius Houston. Um, and if I could have the next, next slide, and I'll show you Mobius in a second, but I, I really wanted to share one of the things, as I mentioned, that we've done is that we have um, integrated the online and the, and the on-site experience of the show and are providing neat content from all of the artists. And I'm sh I want to share um, one of one of which is our sound bites by by every artist. Let's let's play Sarah's for a moment. I wanted this sculpture to be an invitation to slow down and enjoy the experience of looking. That's why I called the sculpture here. It's an invitation to take a minute and be here with the piece, moving around it and noticing the changes in color and light as you go. Since it's abstract, there isn't a story or narrative you have to know or understand. It's more just about being with the object and looking for what it has to offer you. And I think she perfectly, perfectly summarizes what, how, how we envision that our, our guests and visitors would interact with the pieces. It's just about taking time from our busy schedule to come to our campus and um, enjoy in this beautiful outdoor setting, these fantastic pieces. And I also love how Sarah's work really points to the Terrells. I mean, when I think of Houston, I think of James Terrell. And there's, although it's very different, there's so much about the way that he's, he's playing with light and she's playing with projected light and really kind of echoing that sentiment. And so I imagine that it will resonate very clearly for your audience. Yes, your especially. Audience. Yes, then the, the idea of being bathed in light, and um, if I could have the slide of Marta's piece, which should be following, it's exactly the same sort of concept. Um, both works can be ex experienced in a similar way, um, moving around um, around the pieces. In the case of Marta, you could also kind of go through the piece and inside of the piece, but nonetheless, this idea of being bathed by light is possible um, on both, as is the interplay of colors as as the day changes um, and as our position around the work changes as well. Could we have um, next slides? Okay, this is another piece that is a well, personal favorite, but also a favorite of a lot of people that have already seen seen the exhibition. It was made for the 2018 moment of a moment of mass incarceration of migrants, separation of families, immigrant experience. A, Odili was, um, is originally from Nigeria, but he emigrated to the United States at an, at a, at an early age with his family. And I, I think it's really interesting because it has this sort of way um, added meaning, which is not always um, appreciated, appreciatable from, from the work but it will also resonate to our audiences because it's very form, it's formally similar to one of our most important pieces on the collection. If, if we could um, listen to his soundbite and maybe talk, talk through it a little bit, I would appreciate it. My work for this exhibition is titled Negative Space, which was made to address current issues in American politics, in particular, the detention of migrating immigrants 
and the separation of their families at the U.S.-Mexican border. I must acknowledge that this issue is important to me as an immigrant myself, with my family leaving Nigeria at the start of the Biafran War for safer haven in the United States. Back then, my family was welcomed upon our arrival in America and prospered as they became very productive U.S. citizens who contributed their weight to the development of the American ideal. So it comes with great distress to see what America is doing now, which goes against some of the core principles that I thought were intrinsic to the idea of America as a land of freedom with the opportunity to prosper. So in my, my mind, these are kind of two extremes, two poles of um, the work that is on display from Odili's politically charged work to Sarah's kind of more formal approach to color. And um, they, they provide these kind of bookends for, for our experience. I wondered if maybe you could talk a little bit about that too. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, I really appreciate that you created these um, sound accompaniments. I wish we would have done this at Crystal Bridges and I'm going to have to take this back and show it to our team um, because I think it's very effective to not only hear the artist's voice but also to hear their intent for making the work and, and it's less about what the work is doing and more about why which is a huge connector for the multiple publics that we all engage with um, on our different campuses. This particular work reached its, I would say, crescendo at the University of Houston. Um, and one of the beautiful things about this exhibition traveling is that Odili was able to rethink it. And um, one of the things that he actually regretted is that we didn't create more space in between the 13 flagpoles. And just to kind of give a little context for this work, this is, um, there are 13 20 foot flagpoles and the number 13 represents the 13 original colonies. And the, um, the artist took the colors of the American flag and coupled them with the complementary colors of red, green, and black. And this here is um, a very subtle gesture to talk about how complementary colors enhance and use that as a, um, a kind of metaphor to talk about how difference enhances. Um, and so the fact that, Maria, you said this is outside of your administration building. Yes. So can you talk a bit about shifting it for the University of Houston and, and realizing the full ambition for Odili? Of course. So we, we were challenged because the piece, like you said, we really wanted to be true to his intention and we had to find a sidewalk or corridor of some sort that could accommodate the, the spacing that he, that he preferred, which I believe was like something like 20 feet in between each of the poles, his ideal space. And one of the, one of the locations that we found was, um, for those of you who are in Houston, is um, was the front side of E. Cullen. And E. Cullen is, um, along with three or four additional buildings, are part of the original footprint of the university, but it's also the seat of um, administration for the university. So I thought it was particularly timely and kind of poignant to place the work in conversation with this building that has um, charge meaning as well because his work is also about institutionality and if we think about the University of Houston what is um, the most emblematic of our buildings is is E. Cullen and so and that's there's, there's a very interesting dialogue from that perspective as well. And you also mentioned the diversity on your campus when we were talking earlier. Of course we are um, so if Houston is perhaps the most diverse city in America and the University of Houston is reflects that diversity. It is um, a, a university that has provided opportunities for learning and for advancement to many um, first generation college students, many of many of whom have an immigrant background. And so this uh, I anticipate that this work will resonate with many of our students as well and faculty and staff, of course, we are a tremendously diverse community and I think that having Odili's work on our campus really enhances that experience. And there's also the, the element of the body in both of their works with, as you mentioned, Sarah's, you slow down, you kind of see how light is pouring through the, the spherical discs. Um, with this work, it was important to the artist that uh, everyone had to walk underneath it. Um, and so part of when Brea mentioned needing to find a space that had a kind of either a sidewalk or a walkway underneath that it's very important to the artists that it the the 
flags meet over a sidewalk because he feels that as, a, as, as you walk underneath the flags, you are implicated um, in this conversation, whether or not, or depending, not depending on where you come to the conversation from, right? If you're a first generation American immigrant, or if you have lived here for generations, we're all part of this conversation. Um, and I, I really appreciate the way the body is considered with these two particular works, although sculpture always considers the body. Um, and then and there it's, was, it's relationship to the work, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was a there was um, a work. I don't know if it's in your collection or one that was on loan that resonated formally with Odile's. Yes. So if we could have the final slide, it is yes, it resonates formally. It's a work by Carlos Cruz Diez, um, who passed away in two thousand nineteen, but. I think that our community here in Houston and at our university specifically will immediately find um, equivalences with between both works, although their meaning is completely different. But again, this is another work um, you having mentioned how the body, but it, body relates to where this is another work where your um, it hinges on, it's full appreciation really hinges on you being able to move around it, to get up close, to kind of take take some steps back so that you can appreciate it at a distance. Um, it's double-sided, so it immediately calls upon you to kind of do that walk and um, engage in the same sort of ritualistic movement around the piece in the same way that I think Sarah's piece and Odile's piece also require you to move and um experience it from multiple angle, angles and, and vantage points. Yes. I think now thank, we- Thank we, you, Maria and Allison. We're gonna head into some Q&A. Yeah. Um, so terrific um, to hear this incredible story of these two institutions working together. Uh, before we get started, um, thank you to everyone who has submitted some questions. Uh, we invite anyone to continue to submit questions into the Q&A box. So Maria and Allison, to begin, our guests would like to hear even more about how um, you have been collaborating and the exhibition logistics. In other words, how was it funded in both places? Who had the initial idea? How did you decide to collaborate, go further than you have already? And how does this exhibition fit into the longer term plans for organizing and traveling shows and then the second part of this is, um, Allison, I, there is a question by a few folks wondering how many pieces were in the Crystal Bridges um, presentation of Color Field. Allison, maybe you could talk about um, that and then also address the funding structure at Crystal Bridges and um, I'll take it from there too. Sure. So um, the exhibition originated at Crystal Bridges and I am the curator that um, conceived of it. And originally I'm, I, my memory um, is, uh, I, I want to say there were 14 sculptures, 14 artworks plus Amos's um, at Crystal Bridges. But remember that Jeffy created a few new works for Houston. So there's a bit of a difference there. Um, and Maria and I actually met at the Public Art Consortium. So we sat next to each other at a, an annual convening that Brooke Cameron Rappaport um, organizes and the Madison Square Park Conservancy puts together. And we sat next to each other and started talking about what we were doing. And um, I had images from the exhibition and Maria immediately saw resonance with um, the university and the initiatives and really brilliantly decided to um, move forward with, with collaborating at the University of Houston. And maybe Maria, you can kind of speak about how that unfolded for you. Yeah, so at the time that we met, we were um, developing Marta Chilindron's project and I immediately saw some um, incredible connections between her work and her focus and, and the works that were on display. We also wanted to, um, we've been working since I joined um, the university, we've been working towards recasting how people think of UH. And I think um, it's been very much on our minds that we wanna make sure that when people think about the university, they think of it not only for its stellar academics or athletics, but also for its um, 
arts and the powerhouse that it is in terms of the arts. And so bringing a traveling show and especially something that had never been done here, which was a traveling show of outdoor sculptures to our campus was sort of the last step so that we could realize that ambition. And so we, I felt like everyone here kind of needed to, um, needed to have gone through the experience. Um, here in Houston, as I've mentioned, it's been um, the Brown Foundation supported the exhibition and the temporary public art program through seed seed capital but we are continuing to grow that and continuing to find opportunities to bring artists whom we may not be able to work with through our temporary program thank you maria and allison we have another question about talking about the interactivity of um, sam falls pieces maybe you could both comment on that a little bit so there is a, a maze and then there's this essentially some giant wind chimes. Um, Sam Falls is an artist that ha received, has a background in photography and received early training in photography. So although that it, it's not obvious from the pieces, they both reference this interest. Um, the maze actually um, has some openings and, and sort of slits throughout the panels. And so it's an invitation for people to go inside of the maze, but at the same time, he's very really interested in capturing images um, with the changing light. And so he creates these sort of, um, the work elicits these sorts of photographs. So not exactly prints, but um, still sort of images nonetheless. And um, the wind chimes also kind of record specific moments in time. Every time that one of the chimes is activated, paint chips, away slowly and so that again is a reference to time and the pass passing of time which is another um one of the impetus be behind photography allison we are very excited here in houston to invite our visitors to kind of play with these pieces and wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you saw people enjoy the art at crystal bridges you know how what were the many ways in which people kind of experience the outdoor sculptures in hopes to inspire our friends here too sure well you know it was it was pre-covid so um there were there were many in our when we are able to gather many programs that encourage people to come to the north forest so we had a, a concert series we have it on thursdays and saturdays and um the some of the works were placed in proximity so that when there was an intermission, guests would be invited to engage with the sculptures. Um, we had quite a lot of interaction with the wind chimes because they have that not only are you able to touch them but then the audible sound that emerges when the chimes hit the, the center structure. Um, and there were, you know, we're often telling people not to touch things um, because our campus also has a, a big um, permanent collection. And this was a real treat and an invitation for people to engage and, and touch and, and kind of suspend their understanding of how they should relate to contemporary art and make it a bit funner. Um, so those were, those were some of the exciting engagements. It, it was family friendly, but also I saw, you know, adults and, um, people with children without children engaging and having a lot of fun with climbing into the maze, which you can climb into one of the apertures, those openings. Um, the artist calls them apertures, kind of like a camera has an aperture. Um, have you, Maria, have you seen anyone engage yet at the University of Houston? Well, yes, my kids. <laughs> When I want, when I brought them, when I brought them, that was the first thing they did. But yeah, they welcomed the, what they welcomed that opportunity to actually climb inside the work. Um, and that kind of reminds me to another, another piece that is along um, in that same spirit is um, typos formed from life, which we did not focus too much on, but it's inspired by both pop art and um, the Memphis Design Group, but again, also by forms from childhood. So all of our old building blocks, and I think people are also kind of making those connections as well. It's really, a, truly a joyous, um, joyous ensemble of, um, of works. It would be wrong for me not to plug that if you were to walk the exhibition, it's about a mile, so everybody can get their steps in, as well as experiencing some art. So one, uh, one more question for the evening is, of course, 
how can Houstonians come and, and, and others come visit? What, Maria, what do you want folks to know about how easy it is to come and park your car and visit our wonderful exhibition? So we actually um, designed the exhibition so that it would have two kind of entry points. One is near the Welcome Center garage, which offers um, visitor parking, and the other one is near the Arts District of the University, which has ample parking for everyone. We are asking right now, as we're under COVID, to um, register in advance for free timed entrance tickets and you can do that through our website which is publicartuhs.org but it's a very simple process free for everyone we're just asking that you register in advance we have downloadable maps we um, have a lot of interesting content and there's potential um, great opportunities for self-guided tours um, right now so we've got everything in place for a, an overall exciting um, experience at UH. Wonderful. We're looking forward to welcoming so many of you. And just to be on the spirit of time, that'll wrap up our Q&A for this evening. I know Judy Nyquist would like to give everyone some closing remarks and thank you again for being with us. Hello. Um. You can see me and hear me. I don't see myself. Yes, we can, Judy, loud and clear. Great, great, because I don't see myself on screen. Sorry about that. Anyway, thank you both. I'm certain this discussion has inspired you, like me, to visit our campus and enjoy these amazing, beautifully conceived and presented whimsical and joyful, joy-filled works for yourself. Um, the website has already been mentioned. Gabby, I'm wondering if you might put that website in the chat as well for our guests so they can see it and link onto it. Um, and of course, it provides those details that you need like parking and maps and so forth. I was not aware, like Allison, of the interactive um, of labels and I can tell you they are amazing. So I can't wait to go and listen to every single one myself. Um, you know, you do have to register on, or we do suggest that you register online so we know who um, is on campus. Um, but as, as um, it was mentioned, Rebecca mentioned, it's an easy process and it's meant to help guide your um, an e easier um, sort of entry onto the campus. Um, please bring friends, family, and colleagues. It's a great social distance place to have a meeting and um, the perfect fall setting for an artful picnic. Now, as we all know, it is a difficult time for everyone, but this beguiling presentation brings beauty and vibrancy to Houston's public. We at the UH, our public art, believe strongly that art in public spaces is an essential element of an active campus and a thriving city now and always. So please come and now we invite you to a very special treat, which is a short video and a sneak peek of what is to come for the temporary public art program at UH. Thank you for joining our inaugural virtual opening. I look forward to seeing you there in the in, the, in real time at some point soon to explore these enchanting works. And as, as the, both panelists mentioned, um, a lot of it has, a lot of what sculpture is about is dealing with the body and the work. And so obviously being on site is really the best uh, experience. Mm -hmm.